Hi everybody, welcome back to the final part in this ZX Spectrum restoration. Um, in the video today, I'm going to be doing something about the heat problem that uh, these uh, old Spectrums seem to get. Uh, the heat problem is essentially around here. It's with the regulator and it's with this heat sink here as well. It's ridiculously small, in fact. If you compare it to a later revision, you can see this is a revision 6A. The regulator has changed position up here and you can see that the heat sink is much, much bigger. Um, we're gonna deal with this heat problem on this board by removing this regulator, removing this heat sink and switching it over to one of these, a switching regulator. This produces five volts. It's a direct swap. So this will come out, this will go in and, uh, and we're away. Now this could be a really quick video, literally me just unsoldering three pins, unscrewing one bolt and soldering this in. However, I thought we'd be a little bit more scientific about these things and not only show that the heat has been completely vanished, but also give you an idea if it actually saves us any power. Because the reason why these get hot is because it transfers unused power into heat. Um, this creates five volts, we feed it with nine volts, so it's got to do something with those four volts. And in this case, it converts that to heat. The switching regulator, on the other hand, doesn't do that. It switches on and off, hence its term, and it doesn't actually ever create any heat. So our heat problem is gone, but also these are far more efficient in what they do with any voltage which is left over. So I thought what we'd do is we'd take some readings now of how much power this thing consumes. Now what I've done is I've rigged up this here, which also looks as if it's lethal, but it's actually quite safe. It's basically a plug and a socket. I've broken the tracks uh, on the positive rail so I can actually feed in my meter and I'm gonna put it on amps and um, we'll feed the power into the spectrum and we'll see what power consumption it actually takes. And we can see that this spectrum, issue two spectrum consumes 650 milliamps. So let's unplug everything, switch that off, unplug that, get the board out and let's get the regulator off. You can probably hear all the fans working in the background. That's the uh, desoldering station now fired up. There's another job I want to do on this board before we uh, wrap it up. But um, first of all, let's get the regulator undone. And uh, this of course, if you remember from our series, was the very first item I replaced to bring this thing back into life. Okay. That's that going to be gone. Now it's just a case of desoldering this regulator. Okay, that's good. Right, that's out. So, like I said, this is a direct replacement. There's plenty of videos showing you how to do this, but um, that is a direct replacement. And as you look at your regulator, uh, that's how it will go in. That pin there with the dot on it is the power in, the middle is the ground, and the, the far right there, that's your power out. That's exactly how it will go in. So this little fella here with the writing on this issue two board is gonna go down here like so. Good, that's that done. Right, so as before, I'm just going to plug in the board, making sure there's nothing underneath it that will short it out, of course. And we'll see what power consumption this thing gives. So there we go, that's 467 milliamps. I think that's pretty good going. What that does mean then is that our original power supply, if we had one, we're gonna be taking a lot greater care of it. It's not gonna be working nearly as hard. Remember, they're only rated at one amp and we're coming in at just under half an amp here. And that thing is working absolutely brilliantly. I'm really happy with that. 
In fact, earlier on, I did a diagnostics check on this board. I plugged in the diag cart, and I think I should do that again. Um, I'll just put on screen now what the readings were on that diagnostics cart whilst I plug it back in now. And you can see how the ranges of power consumption change depending on um, what it was doing. Um, I tend to recall that when it addresses the ROM, it's pulling the most power. Let's have a look, see what this thing does pull now. So I would say that the most I've seen that pull there is 586 milliamps. That's now um, doing its all those interrupts on the memory, and then it will page it, and then it will go to a uh, it go to the copyright screen in a minute. So once it's done all of this, we'll see the power drop in a moment, and that's when we know it's finished. There we go, and that's it. It's done. So the most I saw it peak to was uh, 586 milliamps. Right, so that's done. I'm quite happy with that. Um, that's made a huge difference already. Um, the only other thing on the board which gets hot is this thing, the ULA. Um, and there is an argument to say that you should put a heatsink on it. Uh, there are certainly people online that offer heatsinks for these, but there is a problem. Um, I'm sure you can see here that the ULA is actually socketed. So the height of the chip is quite high. And that means that you can't put a traditional heat sink on the board. If I just get the case, I'll show you what the problem is. It doesn't actually close. You can see that there's no way that the board can close with that chip heat sink in place. So what I've been experimenting with is using this stuff. It's part of a heat sink for memory chips, um, for people who want to call their memory chips, weirdly. And I've been experimenting with this on my Series 4, Issue 4 board, I should say, and it absolutely works fine. And also, you'll notice that by the time you put the case on, making sure I haven't actually closed it down, you can see that the board closes perfectly. And if I do that, you can hear that the heatsink has moved, which means that there is a gap between that and the chip. Now, admittedly, I did modify this a little bit. What I did is I, I bought a load of them actually off of eBay. What I did is I cut one down just using a simple hacksaw. Um, I lopped off the first three chocolate blocks there. Um, and, and I find this works absolutely perfectly. This will fit straight onto the ULA. It comes with a self-adhesive thermal um, adhesive on the back. It fits straight on there, job done. So that's the other thing that we're going to do right now. I have previously cleaned the chip using some IPA to make sure it's nice and clean. Make sure you do that, otherwise it doesn't tend to stick so well. And I'm just going to stick this on the chip. Um, that will dissipate the heat away from the chip. It's not going to cool it fantastically. You're not going to see 20, 30 degree changes in temperature, but that means that that will pull the heat away from the chip. So there we go, that's that done. Right, there's one final task I want to do on this board, and that is I want to re-sit this crystal here. Um, as you can see, it's not fitting into the board flush. There's a reason for that, in that that can, cannot be grounded. Um, so for um, cost-saving exercise, that was mounted a little bit proud from the board, um, so that it wouldn't touch any of the grounding points. I, on the other hand, have spent a couple of pence on some uh, insulators for crystals, and we're gonna use one of these on the bottom of this crystal and mount it upright. There is a couple of people that say that if you do this, you may find that some of the TV signals improve. You don't get that striping or that ghosting effect. So um, we'll give it a go. We'll uh, whip this uh, crystal out and then put it straight back in again once it's insulated. So there's our crystal. So all we're going to do now is we're just going to put one of these insulators through the legs and then mount it straight back onto the board. So there you go, I've put the insulator on the base 
like so. Now it's just a case of feeding it back into the board. Right, so um, I've just done a quick test. Everything is good. I've just done a very simple uh, memory test on everything. Make sure everything is good and I'm happy. I don't think it's made much difference, I'll be honest with you, but I'm certainly happier that it's standing up right there. Right. And here it is, finished in its finery. Uh, I'm really happy how this one's turned out. There's just one job left to do, um, and that is to re-embellish the ZX sign up here. Um, Angela is pretty good with a white marker. Uh, she did the other one that I have got here. As you can see, that one turned out really well. So I'll get Angela to do the same on this one. So that's it, it's done, it's finished. Now all it needs to do is play games. Now I'll just talk through a couple of things that I'm doing here in terms of loading games up. As you can see, I've got, uh, I think this is the Div MMC Future, I think. And you can literally load games from an SD card like this. Uh, put your games, your TZX files and your TAP files onto this, put it in the back here, and you can instantly load the games. No waiting time at all. But I thought, well, actually half the fun is waiting around for it to load and that incredible uh, sound that they uh, they make. So I, I built myself one of these. Um, this was just from bits I had lying around. Five buttons, a screen, an SD card reader, and a Arduino Nano, just some bits I had lying around. I put it together on this perf board, connected a um, three and a half mil socket, mono socket uh, from an old crystal earpiece and uh, and I downloaded Maxduino, which just runs straight off the Nano and it just loads games. Uh, tap files, TZX files, absolutely fantastic. Um, so I've got a load of games on here. I've got thousands, in fact. Um, let me just load it up. And I'll show you the options here that we've got. Uh, we can just navigate around here. We've got games, I've got some favorites and I've got applications. So let's go into the favorites. Got Attic Attack, Checkered Flag, I remember that game very well. Uh, Checkered Flag, Chess, love Chess, Chucky Egg, 3D Defender, 3D Maze, 3D Tanks, 4D Time Gate. That brings back very strong memories, that does. <laughs> uh, Daily Thompson, of course. Uh, oh, I think it's Death Chase we need to play. So it's very simple, I'll just plug this into the back here. Let's turn on the TV grab myself a beer and remind myself of my youth spent in the spare bedroom at home playing games. And let's press play on here. So there we go. Um, hope you've enjoyed this series. I'm now done with this Spectrum. I'm going to play a few games on it and then send it off uh, to its new rightful owner. Uh, who that will be, I don't know. Uh, just going to clean it up, package it up, and then put it on eBay. So that's it. I'm done with this series of videos. I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Um, I keep toying with the idea of a C64. I've never played with one, never had one, never owned one. So um, maybe I'll get a 128, or even maybe I might build a Harlequin. So there we go, guys. Many thanks for watching. I hope these videos have been useful for you. I hope you've enjoyed them. Um, and if nothing else, giving you some inspiration to go and buy one of these old things and get it going once again.